you'd like to hear? <laughs> question. I mean, I understand there's been a discussion, either partially successful or wholly successful, but not successful at all, or something, <laughs> maybe a seminar tematization. And, um, and so, probably people have gaps or questions or holes or, or maybe they're too bewildered to, to know what questions to ask or maybe they already know anything and there's no point saying anything. So the question is what, what would you most like to, like to discuss? I mean, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of things that you could you could say which might be interesting. One is sort of um, uh, the sort of historical issues about you know uh, what you you thought of as precedents or or what what kind of your motivation was or or what, what sort of analogies led you to these kind of you know ideas. Um, other, other kind of things might be uh, where you see it going from this point. Whether you think these are ideas are kind of have run out or, or with a new, you know, need, need some new ideas. Okay. Just a couple of ideas. Yeah, okay. Okay, who else has something to say? I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing an overview of the cover piece. I might be interested in hearing something about the um, non fiber case, the proof that doesn't use this theta conjecture. Oh, non fiber case. So this is the, what sort of the, yeah. <laughs> it's a topological property. We're going to select, I mean, we're going to, whatever, of, uh, of limits. There was actually several approaches by now, which are you know somewhat common. But I'll talk about how I was first thinking. I mean, so this is <coughs> limits of groups of, of Kleinian groups, <coughs> which are not Fuchsian, I would probably general ones. So the, I mean, the easiest one to grasp is that the, that if you take quasi-conformal deformations of a, <coughs> you have a three-manifold that, you have a hyperbolic three-manifold with boundary that has no cylinders, it's a cylindrical, then this deformation space of hyperbolic structures is compact in, in the sort of topology of algebraic convergence. <coughs> A H of M is compact. Is is one of the statements, and then then um, there's more complicated. Is the case of the case? Okay, let's let's go on. What else would people like? There's only an hour, so <laughs> we have to choose. But let's pick the best thing to to discuss in the hour. Is this enough possibilities? Okay, I'm going to do a quick show of hands what to concentrate on. Um, you can do zero to four of these, but zero is equivalent to four in terms of voting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so raise, raise your hands and we'll just quickly. This one, <coughs> this one, this one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and, and this one. Okay. Okay, so um, less technical. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, history of math. 
mathematics is always the history and motivation. I mean, this is always a complicated subject because different people. Mathematics takes place in lots of people's minds, of course, but you know, when somebody thinks a thought, it's original to them, or else they learned it from somebody else. I mean, you know, the question of who originates mathematics is always tricky, I think, because uh, because it's a kind of resonance phenomenon that happens. When, you know, somebody's thinking about something or other, and somebody hears them, and they're inspired to you know, think about something else. Um, so I, for me, um, actually I began thinking about hyperbolic structures on three manifolds when I was a graduate student and I was, um, I mean there were, actually I began thinking about hyperbolic structures on manifolds when I was undergraduate did a, uh, we had a senior seminar or something about, we, about using Coxeter's book on geometry and started looking at what we did, included hyperbolic geometry and I started thinking, you know, I wanted to really see what hyperbolic geometry looked like. I started making paper models as an undergraduate hyperbolic paper. And uh, it is, it pretty soon it's pretty amazing what you can make with these hyperbolic paper. Instructions, and, you know, and then I, you know, started. It started to become, in some, you know, in some sense, a lot of geometry can sound abstract. Like here, I mean, this synthetic geometry is sound abstract. Like you're making deductions and so forth. And and to me, that was a very important process of, you know, having the hyperbolic plane become real in my head. I understood exactly what it was. It's real. I don't know how to say that. But then, when I was studying foliations, um, certain constructions using hyperbolic geometry were important in constructing foliations for some of these vast numbers of invariants that uh, I was involved in one route, other people. <laughs> um, and I got, you know, it, you know, it was found that from a hyperbolic manifold, you could find foliations that were constructed foliations that had certain values of various characters and classes for foliations. But then I started wondering, you know, how are there any examples of hyperbolic free manifolds? I started thinking of lots of ways to construct examples of them. What and one of the ways is um, I mean it turns out well I rediscovered this fact that um, that you can uh, you can find uh, the sort of truncated tetrahedra. In, so 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 it's like a tetrahedron with its points cut off. All these angles are 90 degrees, and the other and where the other angles are um, pretty much arbitrary. And <coughs> except the tetrahedron exists either in Euclidean space, hyperbolic space, or spherical space. But, but there are many of them that exist in hyperbolic space. So you can, for instance, make a tetrahedron, truncated tetrahedron with pi over 2, pi over 3, and pi over 7 angles. So it, uh, it, it's the easiest formula is to uh, so <coughs> opposite edges have equal angles. These are all pi over 7. Well, the other angles are 90 degrees. And then using gluing these together by reflections, you get lots and lots of answer. You get lots and lots of manifolds. And um, I, was, I, I guess Klingenberg was teaching a course at Berkeley on differential geometry. He told him about these constructions, which are very elementary. And he told me that in Cobb that only known three examples of closed hyperbolic manifolds. Anyway, something. Not many people say? knew many examples of, of actual There were many examples? Or there were many actually known by various people, but not very concretely or not very well. Yeah. But I mean, they're very easy, simple examples, and there were other schools of mathematicians who knew them 
long ago, but, um, yeah. but just there were many people talking about animals without actually knowing many could exist. And I started giving talks about foliations, and um, I realized, you know, this kind of thing could be generalized, that, that you could make lots and lots of polyhedra with, um, with almost arbitrary angles less than 90 degrees. I mean, I don't know why I figured this out. I tried to give it to a student, actually, to prove for a PhD thesis, but he didn't manage to do it. Um, I mean, much later, I learned that Andrea had proven that theorem, that he had, I mean, the characterization of which angles work for, um, for angles of polyhedra. But, but, you know, I, I was off in a different orbit. I didn't, never heard of these Russian mathematicians who knew a lot about hyperbolic geometry. Um, I was gradually discovering this stuff, gradually, in some way, we intuiting that lots of three manifolds have hyperbolic structure. But to me, a, a, a key, a key time Oh yeah, then I started working on um, this theory of homeomorphisms of surfaces and pseudo and also homeomorphisms and so forth. I don't think I you know, want to go on the whole everything, but um, I started wondering. Well, I, anyway, just grad for me this this intuition just gradually formed by talking to various mathematicians. So um, and there it was a question in combinatorial group theory that I was talking to somebody and uh, we were trying to find things you could prove about manifolds that would prove they're not hyperbolic. And, and it seemed pretty obvious that a three manifold with fibers over a circle couldn't possibly be, have a hyperbolic structure. I kept trying to think of proofs of that. Um, and they kept I kept proving it, but then when I went to explain it to somebody, the proof had a fallacy. And then finally I started thinking, well, actually that, that inspired me to think of this the pseudo and also structure, what the surface would have to look like, the fiber of a three manifold, the fibers of the circle would have to look like. It would have to be bent up in the sort of, I mean, bent along some, well, how I now think of it as, quadratic differential more or less qualitatively described how it's then how the quadratic differential needs to reproduce itself. But then, you know, I thought, well maybe someday I'll be able to do this, but it seemed extremely hard. I tried to do it just by direct geometry, you know, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then I was very shocked when Charles Jorgensen came came by my office and he told me actual examples of three manifolds of five group for a circle hyperbolic structures. Um, I mean, like, these are the things that the orbifold versions of the theory are not. Then I think it was after that that I actually worked on the pseudo theory, and I was very shocked when Ayers showed me this, found this analytic proof of the classification theory, and then I, got, I guess I also learned that a lot of it was related to what Nielsen had done earlier. I mean, you know, I've discovered a lot of these schools that would have been relevant after I, or simultaneously, I mean, in anyway, a late stage when I actually proved this stuff. And when I, when, Bear, when I started meeting bears, that made me think of this kind of deformation theory of um, Three manifold groups, these you know these tiny groups, and it made you think about this. It made you think this theorem is true. I mean, I would ask Bears if there was an easy way to prove it from the theta conjecture, basically. I mean, this, well, not the theta. I mean, this is anyway using analysis to prove that um, this leopard spot picture that you have know, a, a three manifold group which has a limit set that that, that this looks like Swiss cheese. And, and now if you hold one conformal structure steady on the quotient 
of one of the components of the domain of this continuity and vary all the others, it seemed like uh, the structure should only vary and find in the map. I mean, just qualitatively, it seemed like that. And I, you know, I talked to Bears, tried to get him to give me an analytic proof. I talked to Fefferman, and tried to get him to give me an analytic proof of that. I didn't know enough analysis to do it myself. And, um, but I, I started suggesting, you know, I started saying, this is a likely way to try to prove that hot thing animals were except for the vibrant ones are hyperbolic. And then again, I was very shocked when um, I was in Warwick and um, Bob Riley gave some talks about um, hyperbolic structures on hot components. And he, he just had been using computer programs to compute many, um, many examples. And he, he actually you know, stated this conjecture that um, that all, of, well, the correct conjecture about knots, <coughs> knots that are not, um, I'm not sure how clear, how exactly he's stated it, but you know, knots that are not satellite knots and not torus knots, are, he called them excellent, <coughs> okay, excellent representations. He came at it, Bob Riley came at it from looking at representation theory of groups and, you know, like a PSL2 of finite fields. And then he discovered that a lot of these representations came from a whole series that, that fit together that actually came from PSL2C. They were just quotients. They were just um, congruence quotients. And then he started to think, well, maybe they're discrete faithful representations. And he wrote these elaborate, very, I mean, it was a mammoth effort on his part, very, very persevering with computer programs to actually prove that these group these groups are acting in a discrete, faithful way by constructing a fundamental domain in this um, sort of interval arithmetic, I think, to show that the things fit together and checking the conquer. Checking a lot of stuff. Anyway, I was quite amazed that somebody else had sort of found all these hyperbolic structures and not components, and I thought I'd better get busy and um, work this out myself before somebody else does. But, um, but, but so that, is that, did I answer your question partly? That's, um, that's how I came to it. Um, you know, I thought I was a lot of times sort of doing something totally different, new, and then I realized there were other people who also thought about it, and I learned a lot from them. History and motivation. Um, oh, there's also this. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. There's a circle packing theory. I mean, it's another whole business of um, history where. Um, I forget exactly what my personal what the process was. Um, I, mean, but, I mean, I yeah, and, and Andrea's theorem was a big surprise to me. Okay. So Andrea's theorem, so it you know it's it's a little tricky to characterize which tetrahedra have elliptic, hyperbolic, or Euclidean structures. I mean, well, I mean, it's it's not that tricky. There's this sort of coxeter diagram and determinant you calculate. I mean, you need to figure out the signature of a quadratic plane. But it's a non-linear kind of condition. You have to. Well, I mean, it's. But Andreas theorem says if you have a if you have a polyhedron, if you have a if you have a subdivision of the um, sphere, let's for now make it with um, dual to a triangulation. So each vertex has three polyhedra attached to it. And now you want to ask, um, now you want to assign, we assign some angles here, like, um, you know, maybe this is 90 degrees, 
maybe this is 33 degrees, maybe this is 17 degrees. I mean, what's most useful is when these are of the form pi over n. So, you know, so it's 33 degrees, maybe 30 degrees, and you know, whatever, maybe this is 20 degrees. <laughs> the, the, these three angles are not the angles of a spherical triangle because they add up only to uh, 140 degrees. They're, they're the angles of a, of a hyperbolic triangle. So um, to have, but you can have three planes that meet in these three angles in hyperbolic space. It's just that they they meet. They, they meet topologically in a configuration like um, so, like I mean, they make a they make a prism. There's a unique plane. There's a plane orthogonal to the three of them. <coughs> that, so you can you can sort of put in a you can interpolate a little triangle here with um, 90, 90, and 90, and then anyway. So so if you have a if you have a assignment of angles to the edges of a polyhedron. And if the polyhedron has the property that, OK, no, I mean, the sub spherical subdivision has the property that no, cy no cycle like this, no simple curve intersects only three edges. So I guess they call this four connected illogical. And anyway, it, the, well, I mean, a cycle, it, it has a property that a cycle that intersects only three edges has to just go around the vertex. So if it has that property, and if it's not dual to a it's not a tetrahedron, then there's a very simple, I mean, then there's a linear condition on the angles that say whether or not it exists as a hyperbolic polyhedron. And um, the condition is, that for any for any dual curve of this sort, um, if the if the curve um, oh oh yeah we're assuming all these angles are less than ninety degrees. I, I mean otherwise the conditions are even more complicated. They have to be stated in a different way. But for each curve like this. They, well, basically, the condition is that the angles, the a angles that it need make it, the, the angles of the edges that need are the angles of a hyperbolic polygon. But, so they, the sum of the exterior angles is greater than two pi, rather than the angles, ang the rather than the angles of the Euclidean or spherical polygon. So if that, I mean, so for every curve except, if you have a curve that just goes around an edge, then, then these angles might be the angles of a Euclidean polygon. I mean, that, that's allowed. Mm -hmm. I mean, if this is 90, 90, 90, 90, that's the case that does curve. It's not because, anyway, Andreas there, I, I don't think we need to, I don't think I need to say it precisely as it's been discussed. Anyway, the, Subject to certain linear conditions on the angles, every um, every such structure is realizable as a hyperbolic uh, polyhedron. And so this is this is a special case of geometrization. I mean, this is geometrization for certain kinds of orbifolds. It turns out, I mean, it's so sort of orbifolds whose topology is that of a three ball and where all the singular structure is on the boundary. Um, I mean, basically, Andreas here announced the geometrization theorem for those purple holes. Um, but this is also related to the circle packing theory. So, uh, I mean, a consequence of Andreas' theorem is the circle packing theorem. But if you have any well, I mean, what? If you have a, if you have a, if you have a two-dimensional surface, well, I'll, I'll take a. This is a consequence of the generalization of Andreas' theorem. If you have a two-dimensional surface, and if you have a, 
Um, you have a triangulation of this two-dimensional surface. Might be a sphere, might be whatever. Then, you know, for any triangulation, there exists a constant curvature metric on that particular surface, unique up to conformal equivalence. And there exists a collection of circles, one circle for each vertex of this triangulation, such that um, the, so the triangulation is the nerve of this packing of circles. So in other words, um, there's, a, there's a circle for each vertex, and two circles touch or a tangent if and only of the two, well, I should say there's a tangency for each edge of the triangulation. It's a, it's a really amazing theorem, circle packing theorem. And, it, it, and it's a corollary of Andreev's theorem because of, or one version of it, because um, well, it's both a limited case and a corollary. Direct version, but it was all. But this was also proved by Curva um, back in the 30s or something, and um, it's also like a early. And his proof or his approach to it is also like an early, a early version of this um, deformation theory of um, understanding the topology of limits of deformation theory of hyperbolic of. of Groups. So that's in the, in the case of um, you can consider groups generated by this, class, this classical shot groups. I mean, some of the simplest Kleinian groups, and still interesting ones, are groups that are just generated by um, you can generated by inversion in some collection of circles. So you can take say four disjoint circles and look at the, the Inversion, the group generated by inversion in these four circles. If you, if, if this is like the Riemann sphere, if you inverted this circle, these three circles go to you know, three circles like here, here, and here. Inverted this one, these go to here, here, and here, and so on. I mean, so we can start getting a pattern like this. You can start picturing what the limit set of this group is going to be because now. Now the, the images of these little circles in this inversion become um, you know, three little cl clusters of circles in here, and and so on. And we get in the in the group generated by inversions, you get nested sequences of these circles, and um, and, and the limit set is the sort of it's a canter set that's got the, the nested, going to the limits of the nested sequence. It's a nice program on Kurt's, Kurt McMullen's home page, I think. We'll draw, draw these pictures. So these are some of the groups that were studied at the beginning of this century, and, um, or earlier, I think, too. I, I, I'm not sure exactly when they were studied. Pine and Fricka did this really extensive treatise of Pine and groups, and included some of the stuff. Um, but then, I believe Kerba wanted to understand the limits of these groups. So, you know, what happens? What happens if you? Oh, oh so um, then, then there's a uniformization theory for these groups, namely the the, the domain of discontinuity for this group is the complement of the catter set. The fundamental domain is just the outside of the original circles, the inverting it, just a, you know, like here it's a four function sphere, or a sphere minus four disks. It's easy to see, it's easy to understand. And then this uniformization theory, which I forget if they proved the case or if it was only Bears and um, Alfors that proved it, but I think Kerber might have proven that, you know, every conformal structure that the, these groups are in one to one correspondence with conformal structures on the exterior of these four disks. In any case, I, I mean, it's just this is just the balance the same. Every conformal structure on this four-punctured sphere is 
is realized by ex exterior of so many disks. It's, um, it's just the generalization of the Riemann mapping theorem. But you can consider the case when the conformal structure gets stretched out more and more here and here. And here. So I think Kerbet analyzed the patterns in which these can be circles can be touched. You just take the limit and, um, and then you can get any triangulation. I mean, you can get the touch of a pattern of any triangulation. It's an extreme case of these groups. So, so in some ways, um, that's a, it's another precursor of kind of theory. It's, it's looking at deformations of a handle body or, you know, a special symmetric form of handle bodies instead of looking at deformations of general manifolds. Say something. <laughs> In what context? What was in Kerbe? Yeah. I don't actually know. I can make it up. K O E B E. Oh, okay. yeah, sorry. I don't. Know. <coughs> um, but I, I think it's a. <laughs> yes. I think they thought of it as complex analysis of function theory. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, it turns out that. Holomorphic functions are very, very much determined by geometry. Very close correspondence. So I think it's part of that whole way. I didn't understand what you said about the steer pattern. What was the assertion that if you would you have a computer pattern? But you take an arbitrary triangulation of an arbitrary surface. There's a unique conformal class of constant curvature metrics. So, so like a, if it's a surface like this, a unique hyperbolic structure where there are round disks in that metric, yeah. that one disk for each vertex of the triangulation, oh. and they touch exactly when the um, And this, there, there's some nice computer programs that do this, and people that followed up on this stuff. To, I mean, it's a way to find uh, to approximately uniformize a conformal structure. I mean, there are a lot of ways to use this phenomenon. It's quite neat. When you <coughs> There's a it. procedure of getting it. So, f for instance, uh, just, let me just give one special case. Yeah. Um, if you if you want to approximate, you get an approximate Riemann mapping for a domain like this. It, no. Okay. You can um, you can just put you can superimpose a, a little small equilateral triangle grid like so, and now um, take the collection of all circles centered centered at the lattice points. Yeah. You can take the circles that, that touch each other centered at the lattice points, um, and just take those circles that actually fit inside the domain. This is where the approximation. And now make up a, a new triangulation of the of the sphere. So in other words, we're just using some of these triangles. So or we could just take the you know the vertices that are actually inside here. Now add one more vertex and connect it to every boundary vertex here. Okay. And then um, and then there's a circle packing on the sphere, or in this case, I mean the Riemann sphere, but you, you could just use stereographic projections of plane, the, and this theorem says that you can find, you can realize this particular triangulation by, by um, well, there'll be little circles that are locally touching in, um, in this pattern, except that the, the ones on the outside all touch this big round circles, mm -hmm. and then this turns out to be an uh, approximation of Riemann mapping for the domain. But it's far more general than this. And each, each such pattern is related to a, a 
a lattice of hyperbolic sets, a discrete group with a finite volume quotient, because given a circle packing, given a circle packing, you there's a um, you know it's dual to a triangulation. So anytime three circles tan are tan mutually tangent, there's a fourth circle that's orthogonal to all three, like so. So if we take if we take all all these circles and add in the dual circles, they uh, now think of these. A circle determines a plane in hyperbolic space by if we think of this, just take the upper half space model of hyperbolic space sticking out from here. Put a hemisphere on each one of these. Then all these planes, um, well, two circles that meet at 90 degrees determine planes that meet at 90 degrees. You know, the angles between the planes is the same as the angles between the circles. So, so using the original circles together with the new circles, you've got a whole bunch of planes where all the angles of intersection are um, 90 degrees. And the trait it, they describe a polyhedron in hyperbolic space with finite volume. Some of these are related to not complement. Another, I, I'm sorry, I can't resist. I mean, this is stupid to say, I suppose. But another, another equivalent way to state this theorem is that if you take an arbitrary, I mean, this particular circle packing theorem, if you take an arbitrary, arbitrary triangulation of the two sphere, um, Arbitrary triangulation for the two sphere, you can always find a, a Euclidean polyhedron in this combinatorial type, a convex Euclidean polyhedron in this combinatorial type, whose edges are, um, all the edges are tangent to a unit sphere. I like to call this the mid-scribed sphere. I mean, it's not so a circumscribed polyhedron would have its spaces tangent. Inscribed polyhedron would have its vertices on the sphere. This is midscribed, it has the edges tangent to the sphere. So, and the, the theory of this is actually much nicer than either inscribed or circumscribed polyhedron. So there's a, there's a, um, each, poly, each combinatorial polyhedron, you realize there's a Euclidean polyhedron midscribed around the unit sphere which is unique up to a projective transformation that preserves the sphere, which is the same as the hyperbolic <coughs> isometry. And, and, the, and the relationship is that if you have a, a mid-scribed polyhedron, um, each face intersects the sphere in a circle. Also, the, I mean, for each vertex, if you look at the sphere from the vertex, Find, look at the tangent. Look at the horizon code, the, the circle. The horizon of the sphere is seen in this vertex is a circle in the sphere. They, they, well, these circles become the uh, circle packing. And given a circle packing, you can construct this of this polyhedron by, by taking the points of tangency just drawing the perpendicular Euclidean line through it. All the, all the lines with, from a tangency to a given circle meet at a certain single point. So it makes sense. All the deep. Okay, future predictions. Maybe we should switch to that. Um, I guess I thought I would. I thought or I hoped that the geometrization theorem for all manifolds would be proven by by now, which it hasn't been yet. But I think it will be sometime. Um, I don't know how long. I don't know how long it'll take. But <coughs> I mean, it could happen. So. 
although it might take 50 years, but it might not be that. <laughs> um, but um, but so probably the it's conceivable that it could, that the geometrization theorem for all manifolds could be deduced in some way as a consequence of the geometrization for Hawking manifolds because it's not it's fairly likely it seems um, that that all three manifolds with infinite fundamental group have finite sheeted covers that that have a compressible surface. So <coughs> Nathan Duffield and other doing computer experiments which um, but out of the first ten thousand hyperbolic manifolds in the census we found finite sheeted covers for 9,999. It's probably just a question of how far you can turn it. Of course, no sample, no finite sample is a representative sample of all hyperbolic manifolds. And also, if you only look at hyperbolic manifolds, that begs the question because we'd like to know that. Mm -hmm. But if you assume that the geometrization conjecture is true, then in some sense it should, it should be provable by looking. Yeah, I mean, if all hyperbolic manifolds have finite sheeted covers with a positive Betty number, for instance, then it should be principle provable by looking by that graph. Um, but I think it's a very hard route to take because it's hard to find systematic to systematically find finite sheeted covers by any principle I know for except using hyperbolic geometry. Does anybody else? Know any principle? Uh, I mean, you can do it experimentally, for example. But I mean, at one time I used to think that geometric group theory might provide more help than it so far has to, to find good finite sheet covers of manifolds that have incompressible surfaces. I do think three manifolds are special. I mean. I think it's highly unlikely, I mean, my opinion is it's highly unlikely that all negatively curved groups have finite sheeted covers that have a positive Benny number or anything like that. I mean, that is, well, I mean, I mean some versions of that statement, I think, are false, but finitely presented. Or, I mean, it, Anyway, I, I think, you know, if you try to generalize this statement too much, I think it's probably false. But, for instance, even fundamental groups with negatively curved four manifolds, I think, have very few subgroups of finite index compared to the three manifolds. The three manifolds, that's one possible way, but the Hawkins stuff already could do it with some more topology. But I think, you know, there's some other principle involved, and I guess what I think is most intriguing is, um, um, you know, I think that I think there could be a good analytic way to look at it for the right person who would the right kind of analysis could be connected to physics too. But um, yeah, let me just try to say what I. But I picture, I mean, why I think this is somehow true. I mean, what, yeah, one, one method that I think might actually <coughs> sometimes work to find hyperbolic structures on manifolds. So, uh, so imagine. See, we have a three manifold. We don't know much about it. Yeah, maybe we don't know much about it at all. Um, but so. Uh, 
I think there should be some kind of iterative process that would construct a hyperbolic structure by finding a conformal structure at infinity. So, so um, but you don't, I don't want to assume we understand the universal cover of the three manifold. It's better to start with as little as possible. But there, there's some iterative constructions, like this iterative construction for putting together hockey manifold, or like the iterative constructions that work for understanding iterated rational maps, and uh, I mean, in some cases, iterating on conformal structures. But I, th I think there might be a kind of nice uh, structure for, uh, you know, for, for looking for a conformal structure on an infinity on the three manifold. That would converge either to a hyper to give a hyperbolic structure, or it would converge to find like an incompressible torus or some other structure that um, that, that would tell you a geometry or a reducing sphere, something that would give it's geometric um, decomposition. And the picture. So we can we can just start with a maybe a Riemannian three manifold. I mean there have been there are various schemes to start, you know, some partial differential equation, some flow heat equation type thing on Riemannian structures on the three manifold that I mean that might or might not eventually work. But I think there's a I think there's probably a method that more robust that looks at, instead of looking at um, sort of a kind of lin linear structure on the tangent bundle, the, the basic element I have in mind is looking at the, um, you look at the conformal structure on the tangent bundle, on each tangent bundle. So I, I, I want to think of the uh, unit sphere bundle of a three manifold. The, what, what we really are looking for, if we're looking for a hyperbolic structure, is a, is a kind of conformal structure on the sphere of infinity for this three manifold. If, if you have a hyperbolic metric, the sphere of infinity corresponds to the unit tangent model, because for each tangent direction, you can follow the geodesic down to infinity. And, um, And, and this is a conformal map. Each, each tangent sphere gets the same conformal structure by just following the I mean, look at the geodesics from here, you look at the geodesics from here, you look when they're parallel, and um, that gives a map from the tangent bundle here, the unit tangent bundle, the tangent sphere bundle here, to the tangent sphere bundle here, which is conformal if you have a hyperbolic structure. If you have a negative curve metric, which is not constant curvature though, this map between the sphere bundle here and the sphere bundle here is very, it's not even differentiable, it's very crazy and it doesn't even come close to giving a um, you know, invariant conformal structure. So I guess another way to say this, another way to say this, to look for a conformal structure at infinity, is you can look for a conformal structure on, um, you can look for a conformal structure on each, on the each <coughs> tangent sphere bundle, together with well, but it must, you want to have a discrete structure group for this bundle. So another another way, I mean, a flat connection. So you want to have, we want to look for conformal structures on on the tangent spheres, together with the foliation transfers to the fibers, so that when you follow the leaves of the foliation, so it's a you know, like a have this five-dimensional total space in the bundle, three-dimensional foliation. Each one is each leaf is just a covering space of space. When you follow the leaves from fiber to fiber, there's a map from the, the sphere here at one point over at one point to the sphere at another point. We want to look for that to be. Um, well, we want to find this foliation so that it's. 
so that those maps are conformed. Now, it seems like it's asking for a lot. You're asking for, I mean, just to find such a foliation. It's tricky. Of course, there are foliations just in view of the fact that this, the sphere bundle is, is a trivial bundle. I mean, it's just a product, so you can just find a trivial foliation, but that would be the wrong foliation. What a foliation. Well, let, let me try to get to the decision. The foliation wants to be natural, related to the natural foliation that comes from um, um, that comes from the tangent bundle structure. So what, one way to think of the tangent bundle of a manifold is you take the manifold across the manifold, you look at the diagonal, and you just take a, a little neighborhood the diagonal is M cross M. And it has, it has like two foliations. And so, I mean, you can think of the fibers over M, where these are fibers. And then, then the other factors become a foliation transverse to the fibers. It's sort of the natural fiber structure built into this version of the tangent of any manifold. So it's like an affine foliation. I mean, it's a it's a flat. It's like a flat affine connection. I mean, it's not a connection because it's not linear. So it's it's a kind of foliation that's just the fibers. This is what the, the structure tends to look like an animal is. But here the fibers are discs rather than streamers. Anyway. We start with the Riemannian three manifold. We can there's a tangent sphere bundle. And there's also this little picture of a little so this is like a disc. I mean in this picture, the there's a bundle over the manifold whose fiber is a little disc centered about the point. So you know you think of the three manifold and then you think of for each point, you think of the little well, we're taking nearby pairs of points. So in other words, for each point in the manifold, you think of a, of a small disk centered around that point. So you, know, you just pick some constant, you know, some epsilon, and you look at the disk of size epsilon centered about the point. And so it's like a moving disk. The foliation transfer of the fibers is just the location in the manifold. Okay, so, you, so there's a map. From, from the tangent sphere bundle to this little local micro bundle by using the exponential map. For each unit vector, you take epsilon. You, know, you follow the dude that like epsilon through that. You get a sphere in the manifold. And given a Riemannian structure on the manifold, this, this gives one way to give a conformal structure to each of these spheres. Now, I want to construct a diffusion process on, um, on these um, conformal structures. I mean, so these conformal structures are going to vary from point to point. So the, anyway, the idea is, the picture is, um, so you start with a conformal structure on this one sphere, and then use Brownian motion to um, Picture where you take a little piece of the sphere. I want to have the conformal structure on the tangent sphere evolve by by um, pulling back from fibers. Well, pulling back from 
from the direction which it represents. I'm having trouble saying this in a nice formal way, but there's a picture of, of some diffusion process here on these formal structures on fibers that will tend to make them closer and closer together so that so the, um, so the, the conformal structures become more and more nearly invariant. And this is much like the iterative procedures on the structure of the wall that's coming Anyway, uh, I, I, I think that this is one, one method that might eventually uh, be able to construct Construct uh, hyperbolic structures on three manifolds. I mean, there's a there's an easier. I mean, there's another version of this, a much easier version to, to explain, which uses foliations or laminations, which I also think is likely to work. I mean, this is why I became reinterested in foliations a few years ago. Yeah. So you can. <clears throat> well, if you have a, if you have a, let, let me just say this quickly. It's all my, I've been taken, sorry, wandered too much, been too incoherent. But um, suppose you have a three manifold with an essential um, an essential lamination. So it's a bunch of leaves that are. It's a closed subset that's locally foliated. And, um, and it's supposed to be, I want it to be a genuine lamination. So there, so that means that some of the regions between leaves of this lamination are not just um, are not just products. So suppose suppose you have a lamination like that. Well, uh, the, for, for a lamination of a free manifold, the typical for a lamination in a hyperbolic three manifold, the typical the typical picture is that a, a leaf. I mean, anyway, the good picture that I'm interested in is that each leaf, the universal cover of each leaf in the universal cover of the three manifold, becomes a, a surface that um, that has a limit circle. That, so in other words, it doesn't wrap around and touch itself. So if you have a if you have a foliation. Then, um, because there are always leaves that 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 there are always leaves in the three manifold that um, are not uh, don't remain embedded when you uh, when you when you go out to infinity. They, they sort of wrap the, the limits in infinity wrap around and touch each other. This makes them foliations a little harder to work with directly. But laminations. Um, Laminations typically have, have, or often have this picture. I don't want to universally say that. So one could try to find. So there's a you know there's a whole infinite set of leaves of the lamination, but you could you could try to find the hyperbolic structure for the three manifold by finding the uh, the by finding the shapes of these circles, and there. And this is this is part of what's called the universal Teichmuller space. Or, I mean, they're determined by by the, a conformal structure. Well, on each side of the leaf, there's just a standard hyperbolic structure on a disk, and and this so this shape of this you know the shape of this circle of infinity for the leaf is just determined by gluing together. I mean, take the Riemann mapping for this component, the Riemann mapping. For this component, and just glue them together by a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism of the circle. So now you can imagine a kind of flow on. So one could look for this kind of picture. So given a lamination of the three manifold, one could look for. Well, you choose you choose a conformal structure for the disk on this side, you know, like here. A conformal structure at that end. So for each leaf, you could take a 
the formal structure on the on the normal S0 normal for each normal function. And now, um, and now imagine following out sort of transversely to the lamination. What we'd like is that um, you know when you go out this way, conformal, well the conformal structure is infinity. You know, if this flow, this normal flow line sort of intersects here, then then it should, there should be a little local conformal map between the, the normals in this direction from this leaf and the normals in this direction from this leaf. So you can try to do a, a flow on these conformal structures of the normal directions to the leaves. You know, replacing, you replace the conformal structure on this leaf by, by conform that you've by the conformal structures on on the outward side of leaves a little bit further along. And somehow in principle, I think this should work. It's just hard to get the technical details all pinned down. And the main the main obstacle is really that there's no, I mean one of the main things it's hard to get the right formulation for is that there's no synchronized sort of flow transverse to the lamination of typical foliation that, um, that takes um, leaves to leaves. So, so in other words, if you try to follow flow lines transverse to the lamination, you know, so, some of the flow lines inevitably get to leaves further along than other of the flow lines. And so you want to be trying to patch together a conformal structure from this leaf and then a conformal structure a little further from from this other leaf, and um, well, it's just hard to figure out how to make it all exactly work. I think it's sometimes it will. And, and so this is a potential way to, well, I believe it will eventually work to get um, conformal structures on all three metals with genuine laminations, and um, because of uh, theory that I and Danny Calgari and Sergio Finley developed, I mean, the foliations on three manifolds also give genuine nominations. So, uh, so, uh, I don't know how to extend the foliated three manifolds. Of course, it doesn't help a whole lot because Unfortunately, I mean, it may be that all well, three manifolds have foliations, but we don't have proof. What? It's possible that all hyperbolic, well, it's particularly possible that all hyperbolic three manifolds have genuine foundations. It's likely, but nobody knows how to prove it yet. I've gone on too long. Um, anyway, thanks. <laughs>